right, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Uh, um, I'm gonna, I've done a couple of these virtual presentations so far and um, I'm gonna try to, um, you know, build off of those experiences and make this as enjoyable as possible for everyone. And as Joe mentioned, thank you, Joe, for the kind introduction. And um, I'd love for this to be int interactive and for, for the Q&A section to be a place for discussion. And even after this talk and after Q&A is over, I'd love to invite anyone to discuss the topics that we'll cover today. So. With that, I am sharing my screen already. So I'm gonna go jump over to my keynote and share that so we can jump into the presentation. Um, Joe, I'll ask for you to interrupt me if anything goes wrong, because um, I'm just seeing my, my slides here. So this is a climate for change. And we're gonna talk about a shift in consciousness about how we do our work and live our lives and a gift to our communities that can come from that shift. Um, as Joe introduced me, I am Tim Falls. Um, my current working title is Advocate of Earth. Um, as Joe mentioned, I've been in developer advocacy, developer relations for the last 10 years and am currently in a transition. Um, I would say from those 10 years, I might be somewhat of an expert in DevRel, but I can't say that I'm an expert in climate science or climate change. Um, I'm, no, I'm a learner. I'm learning about this actively. And because I think it's so important and so relevant, um, I wanna share what I'm learning and uh, invite other, people's, other people to learn about it as well. So with that, Let's jump into our agenda. Today, we're going to do a little bit of meditation together. I'll guide us through it. It'll take just a couple minutes, one or two. And then we're going to see some science. Once we've seen that, we're going to make a choice out of three. And once we've worked through that choice and its implications, uh, then we'll go jump into the Q&A. And tomorrow, because this talk, I think, will be so inspiring to you all. We're going to do something about this thing called climate change. So starting with zero, let's jump in to a meditation. So for this, just sit where you're sitting in your, the comfort of your seat or the couch or stand if you like. Um, you can close your eyes. If you wanna shut off your screen, you can do that too, but uh, no need, nobody's watching. And just be quiet in your own heart and mind, and I'll talk you through a little experience. So with your eyes closed, I want you to, I invite you to use your imagination <clears throat> and envision a place in nature, in the natural world that brings you joy. It might be a place that you've been in your life. It might be a place that you've never been and would like to go. It might be a place that's surrounding you currently just outside your windows or a place from a distant memory or from a dream. And as you picture that place, I want you to picture yourself in that place, smiling and enjoying it. And as you enjoy it, I want you to take notice of the sensory experience of the smells, might be the air, might be the plants, might be the animals, of the sights, the colors, the movement,
take notice of the feelings, the physical sensations. Perhaps it's wind or water that you can feel against your skin. And even take notice of any tastes that might be present in this experience. Maybe you're enjoying a beverage while you enjoy nature. Maybe you can taste the odors in the air, the scents. And with all those senses working and active, just take a couple more seconds and quiet by yourself to enjoy this happy place. Okay, now you can start slipping away from that happy place back to our talk and start slowly opening your eyes. And take in the soothing gradient colors of this slide and that meditation emoji. So our meditation is complete. Thank you for joining me in that, if you did. This is the scene, something like the scene that I go to when I do that meditation. It's where I grew up, not this exact picture, but a scene reminiscent of this. This looks like the driveway that I used to walk up from the up and down from the bus before and after school. And I could remember the sound of the creek flowing, the smell of the honeysuckle, and the sight and the touch of the dogs running down the driveway to greet us and asking us to pet them. And this memory, experience, and connection to the earth and to nature is why I'm here talking you talking to you and talking with you about climate change and we'll revisit this a little bit more in our talk but first on to number one from our agenda this brings us to science climate change is something that we just need to look to science too. We can look outside our doors and our windows and experience it for ourselves, but to make sense of it, we need science. So let me share some of that with you, which I've been learning over the last several months as part of my climate change school um, and independent study beyond my coursework. To some, it's bad, it's really bad. There's a mass extinction event happening right now, the sixth one. And this is a biodiversity crisis. Deforestation is accelerating, which is contributing to this. And I'm gonna look at my notes for a moment and just read a couple of the specific statistics around this extinction uh, and what it means to our planet and our planet and the animals and the plants on it. So 60% of vertebrates, 83% of mammals, and 50% of all plants have been wiped out off of this earth, extinct since the beginning of humans. What we've done as humans to this earth so far, will take five to seven million years for the earth to naturally repair itself from the damage we've done. 
global wildlife population has decreased 60% in the last several decades. Of all the mammals on earth, 96% of them are livestock and humans, and only 4% of them are wild animals. 70% of all birds on earth are chickens, and only 30% are wild. And over 15,000 scientists have signed a letter saying we're ruining our planet. So that's extinction. Sea level rise is another big thing. This is definitely happening and it is happening in an increasing way. We're expecting based on um, scientific research right now, anywhere from three to eight feet of sea level rise around the world by the end of the century. And this is already happening in cities where that are by the by the ocean and at um, sea level when high tides come in and full moons come in their streets are flooding so this is a big big deal and heat waves maybe the biggest deal um, an interesting fact about heat waves is when thinking about what we call wet bulb temperature which takes into account both heat and humidity there's a threshold at 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb where even a very healthy human being can um, be depleted and die within six hours of experiencing that type of conditions. And we're already observing those types of conditions um, uh, all over the world. So that's dangerous and getting more dangerous. And finally, there's nine tipping points uh, each of these has to do with thermo uh, permafrost thawing or ice shelves melting or forests turning to deserts. And these are each big events where if we cross a certain threshold, the implications are irreversible and very, very drastic. So like I said, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. And basically what we're trying to do here is keep the warming of our planet as compared to pre-industrial levels below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But since the industrial revolution, we've already reached 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. So 1.5 isn't far off. And current projections show us actually reaching three degrees Celsius by the end of this uh, century. Dr. Chip Fletcher, a scientist and academic and researcher in Hawaii, who is facing this, uh, who provide a lot of information that I just shared with you um, and is facing this head on as a resident um, of an island state. And uh, he said, this is an incredibly dangerous world three degrees Celsius. And also, if we could even keep it to two degrees Celsius, which we're hoping to do, the difference between 1.5 and two is, is dramatic. Um, for instance, at 1.5, about 70% of the ocean's coral reefs will die. At two degrees Celsius warming, all of the coral reefs, reefs will die. So what? Well, that's what we often um, react to with this stuff. That's the little supervillain um, on our shoulders saying, this is too big. And I definitely can relate to that. And I've been doing that for probably the last 10 years of my life, kind of saying, well, I'll, I'll get to it when I can. Talking to one of my friends recently, who's one of the most capable and ambitious entrepreneurs I know. This was his quote. When it comes to climate, climate action, I get discouraged quickly. And I totally relate to that sentiment, that feeling, um, because I've been there and I still get there, um, even though I'm attempting to do this work now. However, we have to be superheroes and not the supervillains. Listen to the voice on the other shoulder. 
Um, and that brings me to us and our communities. So what does this mean for us and our communities? Well, let's first think about who us and our communities are. Us, well, we're human first, then we're developer relations professionals, and we're employees at a company, many of us, most of us. Our communities are oftentimes our coworkers, our customers, but most importantly, they are also human. And in thinking about serving our communities as developer relations professionals in light of the crisis, the climate crisis that I just described briefly, it's really, really important that we remember that we are all human and that we think about our communities, our coworkers, our customers, our partners, our fans and followers as human first not just customers. Because if we think about them as their human selves and all that comes along with that, we can think about how to serve and support them in a much different way than just how they use our product or service or how much money they give us or don't give us. And climate change is affecting every single human on earth in really real ways. So if we can take into consideration our customers who live all over the planet right now, who are oftentimes working from home or putting themselves at risk to go to work outside of the home, taking into consideration climate change and how it impacts each one of those people in their homes on their way to work is going to allow us to think about how we serve them and support them in different ways, more meaningful ways, and more effective ways. So we're all human, and we're all going through something. That's absolutely true, especially today, pandemic happening. But it's important to keep in mind, especially today, with social movements happening, that some of us, what we're going through is worse than for others. And that's a human fact, a fact of human nature in our society right now. Um, and that's a very glaring fact when it comes to climate change and that people are disproportionately affected by climate change based on their socioeconomic status, their race, um, and their ability to basically purchase their way away from where climate change is um, having the most damage. So back to that happy place and the question of so what? Well, this is why. This is, this is why I've chosen to take action. And I think if, if you think back to your happy place and consider maybe because of climate change and because of human behavior that's leading to climate change, this might be what your happy place looks like in the future. And in fact, this is what my happy place looks like now. Um, after the owners of my parents' property tore down all the trees, tore, it out, tore out all the grass, and made it into a field for crops. It wasn't quite this dramatic, but you get the idea. So that brings us to number two on our agenda. We have a problem. We have three choices. We can leave the situation. We can change the situation. Or we can accept it completely. That's according to Eckhart Tolle and The Power of Now. And in our case, for today's talk, and because we care about our communities, we're going to change the situation. And also because we have that gift to give. So that brings us to change. So we wanna change the situation. 
how do we do it? I'll give you three buckets of activity or three buckets of ideas of how we can change the situation. First is learning. Um, a couple of resources to learn from. Terra.do is a climate change school that I mentioned earlier in which I'm enrolled right now. Climate Twitter is a great resource to just listen to scientists. And of course, you have to sift through a lot of uh, garbage as well. But learning is the first step. The more I've learned, the more unavoidable climate change has been and climate action and the more necessary climate action has become. There's a there's this turning point, I think, a tipping point personally, where once you know enough, you can't ignore this problem. The second thing is talk. And by talk, I mean connect with people. Connect with your friends and family and talk about this topic. Make it not a stigma, not a thing that we avoid, but a thing that is always on our minds. Not necessarily in a stressful way, but in a productive way. And find a community, because community is really important <laughs> in this work, because it's depressing and it's upsetting and frustrating and angering and sad. So having a community to support you in all those emotions is important. And through that talk and connection, eventually we'll create a cultural shift. And finally, the third thing to do is act. Take action, be an activist, change your life habits, change your work habits. Do something at your current job or do something at your new job. Go get a new job, I should say. Some examples of this are just lifestyle changes. You know, really shifting how you go through every day and what you do and all the decisions you make, even how you take care of yourself, because it's important to remember that our bodies are part of the environment and taking care of our bodies is taking care of the planet. So start there. And in your current job, if you feel like, well, this isn't working, I'm not working on climate change and there's nothing to do with climate change in my role, I encourage you to take a step like doing a carbon audit for your, for your company. This is something that I did in my last employer and um, I provided an example at the end of this deck and a link to the output of it and would love and have open sourced a tool to, to do it. Um, or, you know, if you get to a point where you can't do what you want to do in your current job, then maybe get a new job start a climate company, join a climate company, um, or start a climate division within an, your next employer's organization. And ultimately, this all amounts to a shift in consciousness where every decision is a climate decision. And we're mindful every day as we go through our lives about the implications of our decisions in terms of the planet. Thinking about Less stuff is better than more stuff. Thinking about less growth and slower growth is better than hyper growth or fast growth, which is hard to say in this world of technology. And just generally having greater self-awareness of um, our actions and the actions around us. And questioning like, what is normal? Realizing that normal was killing us before and realizing that we now have a chance to change. So this shift in consciousness and this, these three things of learning and talking and acting are our gift to our communities. And ultimately what that gift will come across as if done authentically and effectively is love. Our communities will feel our love because we're treating them like humans, we're thinking about them as full humans and not just our customers or our coworkers. And we're thinking about how to support them in all aspects of their life as it's affected by all the things, crazy things that are happening in our lives. So that brings me to number three. I think I'm almost on time. Number three is just questions. 
And as I open the floor to questions, I want to say I have a question real quick um, for any of you who are viewing. I'd love to know if you have thoughts on this presentation in terms of its accessibility to um, people who have vision impairments, because I'm trying to focus on making sure that my uh, my presentations are accessible and inclusive as, to as many people as possible. So um, if you have feedback on that, I would love to hear it and appreciate it. And finally, that brings me to questions. Wonderful. I'm going to so much, escape. <laughs> that was lovely and uh, perhaps intentionally just despite or in accordance with the grave topic, surprisingly soothing. Thank you for making what could have been a very stressful conversation grounded and nice. Um, so questions, we are currently, currently I can see question MVP, Eric is typing in our Slack. So whilst we wait for Eric's incoming question, um, I actually love, would like to kind of go a little bit back from, um, your talk itself and in terms of what we can do. And actually one of the things that's really interesting about you giving this talk is, you know, in your bio, as we said at the beginning, that this has been a in moving into this work has been a recent transition for you. And I guess is your version of taking some action on this. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, about that transition and how, I guess, how you've done that and how anyone inspired by this could, could look to do similar things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, kind of started to allude to it when I mentioned that carbon audit that I did at right. my last employer. And that really was, I think, the the turning point and the beginning of uh, the path to where I am right now and to wherever I'm going from here, which was, um, you know, I had through my own spiritual practice really um, reconnected with this nature that I had left behind when I grew up in the, in the country, in the Midwest. And, you know, for the last six years of my life, I've been living in cities and doing DevRel for the last 10 years, just like flying around the world, right. doing so much, so much damage through that, like mindlessly and thoughtlessly and, and always being in cities mostly, you know, cause that's mm -hmm. where our work happens. Um, and through my spiritual practice and through just like kind of, listening to the signal and the, amongst the noise um, about climate change and seeing some documentaries here and there and seeing movements start, it just all kind of came together with, in, in the last year or two where it's just mm -hmm. like, I can't stop, I can't not do anything about this anymore. Like mm -hmm. I have to do something. And I didn't want to leave my job at the time because it didn't feel safe to do so financially right. speaking. So I just thought, what can I do at this company? Mm -hmm. And then I took advantage of an internal hackathon where we could do whatever we want. That means something outside of your responsibility. And that was my 24 hours of work to get six coworkers together and say, let's do a carbon audit and let's get our self-awareness together on what is our impact as a company. That's awesome. And once, once I did that, that like, brought together this group of employees that grew to like 20, 25 people who mm -hmm. cared mm -hmm. and had this discussion. Um, and then, you know, that kind of snowballed to more and more activity within the organization. And um, in February, I left that company. Um, and that gave me an opportunity to say, like recenter myself and say like, what's next? And, you know, still TBD. And I think, you know, I'm still engaged in the DevRel community because I don't feel comfortable or safe abandoning it right now right. Um, totally. because it's what's helped me pay the bills for the last 10 years of yeah. my life. Absolutely. Um, so also I think there is like, as you, as you kind of said about um, talking about the flying and the way I guess our industry operates, there's, it's not as clear cut as just like kind of abandoning the thing you did do and, going off to climate advocacy because there's still work that you can do with your existing network in this in this space with these people like this talk for example <laughs> yeah 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 so i just reframed it as like yeah and why this talk the, the essence of this talk is like every decision is a climate decision every role can be a climate role every thing that we do in our lives can have some impact on the climate and if we reframe it from oh i gotta go 
dedicate my whole life to this to I have to change my lifestyle and my mindset and shift my consciousness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then we can feel like we're acting on a daily day, day to day basis, even if we don't change our jobs. Right, right, that makes sense. Um, okay, cool. So I will stop hogging time and pass over to our audience questions. Uh, so Eric says, unfortunately, in the US, climate change is a charged topic. Does introducing it into your advocacy risk distracting from your business related message? Um, I would say yes. I think I think there's always a risk. Um, it's a very true observation that it is still, unfortunately, in my opinion, it's a political conversation still, which I I think it is. My opinion is that it is not a political conversation. It is a humanitarian conversation, and. You know, I think this goes along with a bigger shift in consciousness that I was talking about in 2015 at DevRelCon, mm -hmm. um, which was just shifting business to be a more human-centric enterprise. Right. And shifting capitalism to be more human-centric, where the humans are what matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And think about business in a much different way and like, you know, it's important that we educate our, our customers on our product and how to use our product, right? But we also always talk about this aspiration of, as developer companies, as empowering developers to change the world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how are they going to be empowered to change the world if their home's on fire or if it's flooded or if, you know, they're facing tragedy every single day and crisis every single day they're not right, going to be able right. to buy your product they're not going to be able to use your product successfully so i think there is a serious business case to yeah. thinking about your customers and how they are being affected by this crisis right now mm -hmm. where they do their work where they write their software from their homes you know or from their offices mm -hmm. um and that shift can add to the business conversation instead of distract from it. And, um, you know, when it gets down to economics, like <laughs> the economics are clear that mm -hmm. this shit isn't going to keep working unless we change. Right. Like we cannot keep going in the direction we're going. It is not sustainable. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally. And, you know, it's not worth the people, the people that we work for, um, as dev advocates and even like individual contributors or even directors or VPs, they're, they're for the most part right now, not very receptive to this stuff. You know, um, I didn't choose to leave my last job. Um, but I was kind of happy when I was asked to leave, I was laid off. <laughs> Because, you know, I was frustrated at the same time. I described a lot of momentum and, and progress with what I was doing, but I was also frustrated because I didn't feel like the, the message was getting across to the sea levels, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that answered the question, okay. but I, I, I acknowledge the challenge for sure, sure. And I think it's worth overcoming. Cool. Well, thank you for that. So I'll let you know if um, Eric responds to anything further. Um, and I think we've got one final question from Avi, um, which is, what are some ideas for startups with all of the intent but lack of resources in both time and budgets to contribute? Yeah. So I think this is a, a conversation that's been going on for a long time as well in the mm -hmm. startup world where um, with diversity and equity or equality and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Or startups say, well, that's the thing that we start to worry about once we're established. That's the thing that we start to worry about when we have more resources. Mm -hmm. My argument, my my counter argument to that is no. <laughs> it's a thing that you have to start now. Both diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is completely intertwined with a, a climate climate consciousness as an organization. And it's, I think, very, very unwise to say we're going to worry about this later because the impacts that are going to, 
the things that are going to impact the company are already happening. And ultimately, I believe that the companies who really do make a meaningful shift away, like mm -hmm. as soon as possible, are going to get the attention of consumers. Consumers mm -hmm. already <laughs> already see that this is a crisis and um, are going to get the attention of people who might want to work for them as well. Um, so I think that my advice to startups is figure it out. Don't ignore it. Don't delay. Divert your ad money right. to do something. It, do it doesn't take a lot of money to mm -hmm. develop, a, develop your self-awareness as a company. It doesn't take a lot of money. It actually can save you a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, by thinking differently about developer relations, right? We're, we've all been forced into doing developer relations differently right now. And I think that we're all saving money because we're not <laughs> doing sure. the most expensive thing of DevRel, which is flying. Right. So, and, and what's happened so far, we're anticipating global emissions to decrease by 7% this year, mm -hmm. which is like the first time in <laughs> forever <laughs> where emissions have decreased like that. Which is a point. It's a proof, a point proven that we can do it. We can do yep. things drastically different, and we can still get our jobs done, and we can save money, right. and therefore divert that money into the things that we weren't doing before. Um, so it wasn't a super specific answer, but I, I just think it's we're entrepreneurs. Startups mm -hmm. are built entrepreneurs. We're proud of our way, our ability to innovate and overcome challenges. This is the biggest challenge of our lifetimes. Right. And it's not one to be ignored. More access to innovate on, right? Yeah, exactly. And awesome. you know, there's so many solutions not being built yet out there mm -hmm. that need to be built. So, um, not only can you take a different approach with the current business, but you can take advantage of the, <laughs> the multiple multitude of problems that need to be solved around this issue uh, mm -hmm. and build businesses there. And you know. Cool. Help change the help change the world like we said we're going to. <laughs> well, I hope this inspires some of our viewers to do so. And um, we haven't had any further questions, so thank you very much, Tim. That was great. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.